in some sense, uh, what I uh, first uh, to say to you this evening is very simple, because all is in the picture you have. <laughs> <laughs> so I can say, examine the picture with uh, care and uh, attention, and uh, you can see here, uh, it's a facility, it's bigger, <laughs> and uh, uh, you can uh, know immediately uh, my, uh, my things. <coughs> and uh, finally, uh, what I said this evening is a sort of uh, commentary of uh, this, uh, in some sense, mysterious picture. <coughs> in fact, my goal is to describe the structure, the global structure of the contemporary world from three different points of view. First one, from uh, dialectical point of view, that is a classical examination of fundamental contradictions in the world, and also uh, taking a subjective approach. Contradiction being not only and not primarily objective contradictions, but subjective contradictions. It is why it's in some sense the ideological structure of contemporary world in globalized capitalism of today. Second point of view, an historical point of view, is the contemporary world is not a pure creation, it is independence of the past. And for example, we can interpret in the picture some very fundamental sequence like uh, the Second World War or the Cold War too. And uh, first, at, uh, after that, we have a political and militant point of view which is to include in the vision of the picture recent facts like uh, Arab Spring, Occupy Wall Street, Syria, Libya, and so on, and so all the great movements, including the riot in France and uh, London in the suburbs of uh, Great Towns. And as uh, final conclusion from a prospective point of view that there are some vision or some possibilities concerning our political future. It's uh, the final risk <laughs> because all what is said concerning future is generally false. <laughs> but uh, uh, we cannot go away without some vision of the future. So we have to take the risk of fascism. Now, the general synthesis is in the diagram you have to can see. Now, the most uh, important point of all my uh, talk this evening is that the contemporary world cannot be understood from the point of only one contradiction. It has been during a large part of the, the last century that is the case. We have the imperialist camp against the socialist camp, for example. Or you have the explanation of local struggles at the end by the contradiction between the bourgeoisie and the working class. So, many orientations of uh, uh, the last century was to explain the global configuration 
to cause one fundamental contradiction, which was named in general the principal contradiction. And all other contradictions are secondary uh, contradictions, which can derive from the first one. My hypothesis is that today, the subjective uh, fundamental situation is the result of the interplay between two fundamental contradictions and not only one. These two contradictions are uh, the two lines, nay, principal contradiction, one and two, <coughs> so two principal contradictions, which is the sense is a contradiction. <coughs> and uh, these two principal contradictions are the contradiction between capitalism and communism, classical one in some sense, and the contradiction between tradition and modernity. The most important point in uh, political action today is to understand how these two uh, principal contradictions compose a sort of complex vision of different facts, different events in uh, the world today. Some words concerning separately to begin the two contradictions. What I name contradiction between capitalism and communism is not in some sense an active contradiction today. It's a possible contradiction, if you want a structural contradiction, but it is not constituted at a level of uh, global subjectivity. So this contradiction is not in the same position that, for example, during the first part of uh, the last century, when we have clearly, uh, at the level of state, a fundamental contradiction between, for example, the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, which was a sort of explicit form of contradiction between capitalism and communism. In fact, uh, uh, there, today we can maintain the fundamental contradiction between capitalism and communism at the first abstract level. Communism is only the name of a possible world which uh, don't be regulated by globalized capitalism. So it's uh, the abstract negativity, possible negativity, or opposite term, uh, in front of uh, capitalism. Fundamentally, uh, what is behind uh, this uh, possible or ideal uh, uh, contradiction is the choice between uh, individual freedom free enterprise and democratic constitution on one side, with a link between the three terms, individual freedoms, free enterprise, democratic constitution, private property without limits, and professional politicians at the level of the state, which are elected by people. So it's uh, not only a pure economic definition. Subjectively, is something like a world, a complete world, socio social, uh, social uh, economic, and politics, where the norms, the fundamental norms, is freedom in some sense, at the individual level, and freedom with by necessity, as a generalization of uh, freedom without limit, free enterprise, and democratic constitution, that is, uh, that the political power uh, is not.
not a traditional ruler, like a king or a prince, and uh, he's not a revolutionary power, dictatorship or political, but he is a, a, a play between professional politicians with some changing tendencies. <coughs> All that is really uh, a sort of image of uh, the possible world uh, and is probably today the dominant image of a possible world at the different level, politics, economics, social, and finally at the individual level. By communism, we can uh, uh, have in fact, collective equality, so as a tendency, equality as something as important, maybe more important than freedom, than liberty. We have drastic limitation of private property, and we have uh, the idea of concrete democracy without professional politicians. That is democracy which is the action of the people as such without professionalization of politics. And it's also something like a world which is the opposite of the capitalistic world, but a world which today has no existence. <coughs> So, uh, I insist on this point, the first contradiction today is purely of uh, idealistic nature in some sense, or ideological nature. It's not the contradiction between two existing worlds, and it is why today we can say that in some sense uh, we have only at this level, for this contradiction, only one world. One world is the world of globalized capitalism. I want to naturally return to the most precise definition of the two terms. In the world, in the term capitalism, we must understand that individual freedom are the most important ethical norm must be completed by freedom of enterprise and economic competition. So the argument in favor of private property competition, economic competition, and uh, freedom of enterprise in, in the global field of a radical conception of freedom by an exclusive norm, in some sense. In this vision, complete equality, and in some sense uh, equality, and uh, collective appropriation of uh, different means of production and different uh, enterprises, is impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible because that form of equality is in fact a limitation, a too big limitation to individual freedom. And so all that is also the contradiction, the, the very important contradiction between liberty and equality. Then the French Revolution has said liberté, equality, fraternity. <coughs> But uh, the history uh, is the demonstration, the proof, that uh, the relationship between liberty, freedom, and equality is a difficult one. Not at all something evident. Uh, in uh, his uh, big memories, Chateaubriand, French écrivain Chateaubriand, has said that there exists close relationship between equality and despotism. <coughs> and the <coughs> close relationship between equality and despotism. And uh, it's true that uh, 
during the last century, all the attempts to limit private property, the appropriation by the state, practically all the economic fields, have been with uh, some very despotic states. <coughs> so, if uh, you stay in the last century, Chateaubriand was right. We have experienced uh, historically that uh, between uh, the general realization in the economic field of some form of equality and uh, political despotism, there is a close relationship. And it is why in the globalized uh, capitalism of today, uh, the norm is to affirm that strict equality is impossible. It's impossible uh, because the price to pay is, by necessity, restriction of the individual freedom, drastic restriction of individual freedom. And so if freedom is, uh, is liberty is the absolute norm, uh, it becomes that equality is, in fact, impossible. And the uh, uh, third point, the existence of the state the power of the state with uh, professional politicians, uh, professional police, uh, separated army, and so on. All that is a necessity. And the necessity to, for many reasons, but to protect private property first. <coughs> and a big part of uh, the action of uh, police and so on, and the laws and the justice is to protect private property and to protect competition inside the private property. That's right. yes. And uh, private property and also the individual rights in some limits, <coughs> some limits. And so you see, finally, we have three fundamental determinations for what I name here capitalism as a global world. First, uh, illimited freedom for enterprise and private property, impossibility of strict equality, and the state as a separated machine, as a something which exists apart from the collectivity, as a necessity, for many reasons, but first, to protect private property, and so to protect also private property against equality. <coughs> On the side of communism, I want to say immediately that by communism, I don't understand uh, what has been named communism during the first part of the last century. The Communist Party, the Soviet Union, and so on. I return to the primitive meaning of the word communism, the meaning that we can find in Marx, for example, but not only in Marx, in Mese Sinker no? of the 19th century. And you have a equally three fundamental points. First, no obligation, it's possible, it's possible that there exists no relationship, no strong relationship between the existence, the free existence of society and private property. The communist affirmation at uh, this level is the affirmation of a possibility. Marx, naturally, was not speaking of reality. <coughs> it was a project, an idea, was, uh, So it is why, returning to uh, this place, I speak of possibility. So the first point is to affirm the possibility where the free existence of the collective and individual uh, 
is not uh, in relationship of, with the uh, private property as a necessity. So the possibility of a collective organization of production, what Marx named free association, free association, to organize production. And so it's uh, not a necessity that uh, the strict form of uh, uh, collectivity be under the law of the private property. The first point, major point, and you know that in, uh, in his famous manifesto, manifesto for the Communist Party, <laughs> uh, Marx uh, writes that finally all what he has said, uh, written in this book, can be resumed in one sentence, abolition of private property. So it was the center, uh, it was really the center of the communist vision, that is the disparition of private property, which was a law in all forms of uh, human collective existence uh, from the beginning of the day. The first point. The second point, is no obligation, the possibility, negative possibility, there is no obligation to organize the labor, the work of people, in a form which is specialized. So it's not a necessity to have always a division of the labor. For example, Marx insists that is not a necessity to accept forever the distinction between intellectual work and uh, manual work. That uh, it's not a necessity to accept the social division between uh, men and women. Which is not a necessity to have a difference between direction and execution. All that which are the different forms of the organization, the general organization of production, work, and so on. Communism affirms that is not a structural necessity and that we can organize the society and working in another manner. This point is very important because it has been not at all realized in the uh, Soviet Union. Soviet Union, uh, we have very strong differences between uh, the task of direction and the task of execution, between uh, uh, the car of uh, factories and the workers. So it's a point which was really uh, fundamental for Marx, the disparition, finally, of all the differences uh, of uh, <coughs> the task and work of the people, which uh, has been largely forgotten uh, in the execution. Third point, in communism, there is no obligation of the existence of a separated state. So, after all, all problems inside society can be solved by discussion inside society and the existence of a separated machine, of a, a state which is uh, absolutely apart of the collectivity, is not a necessity. So, it was the uh, three fundamental points of the idea of communism. Three negative possibilities. Three negative possibilities, not necessity of private property, not necessity of uh, the organization, specialized organization of labor, and no necessity of separated state. Naturally, uh, as a consequence, we have the conviction that all forms of uh, collective organization which oppose some parts of humanity to other parts must disappear. For example, uh, uh, the nations themselves must disappear. There is no necessity that uh, people are organized in their national form. So Marx was from the very beginning 
internationalistes. Vous connaissez les jeunes transnationalistes. Il y a des absolute affirmation that in the bottom of the nation there is something archaic, something which is the maintained of something like cars and uh, <coughs> opposition between some parts of humanity to some parts without any rational reason. And it is why you have the famous idea <coughs> working workers that are no good thing. <coughs> they are citizens of the world. The idea of everybody being citizen of the world was a fundamental idea of communism. So all that define the first contradiction. The third contradiction, which is a radical one. So we have in some sense uh, two uh, pictures of the world. Uh, which are uh, in strong contradiction, and the center of the contradiction is to maintain or to suppress the private property from the big uh, <coughs> means of uh, production and communication. This contradiction has been, in some sense, the ideological contradiction dominant between. Uh, Particularly the French Revolution and uh, the 80s of the last century, something like that, with the collapse of uh, Sovietism. So I think that during this sequence and this uh, important point, everybody has the possibility to think that there is two possibilities and not only one. And it was a completely different ideological context uh, with today. Because today, uh, fundamentally, there is no strong idea of the possibility of two completely opposed ways. Because uh, we have in the world, which is a world of globalized capitalism, and in some sense, it's uh, uh, the unique idea. <coughs> this idea uh, is criticized, naturally. Many people think that uh, capitalism is not so good. <coughs> and, but uh, uh, there is not the same uh, global existence of the contradiction than before. Before, in any place of the world, we can find uh, communists, uh, revolutionaries, and so on. We have uh, big uh, countries which uh, affirm that they are communist countries, uh, Russia, China, and so on. So we have uh, a construction of the world, representation of the world, image of the world, which is completely different because this image affirms in any case that there is two possibilities. After that, we can discuss if it is true, uh, if there uh, really another possibility, and so on. We have many discussions concerning this point. But at the level of principles, everybody has the experience that there exist two possibilities. And uh, it's uh, why today we are really in uh, an ideological world which is uh, not reducible to the world from, uh, uh, finally, uh, 50 years ago. We are really subjectively in another world. Because it was considerable strength to uh, have the possibility to think that there exists, in fact, two possibilities. I come now to the second contradiction. The second contradiction, which is the contradiction between tradition and modernity. This contradiction is not a recent one, it's not the creation of uh, the last uh, decennies. I think that uh, the beginning of the contradiction between tradition and modernity lies in the 18th century, the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment in France, the, the philosophers. That is the affirmation that a non-religious world is possible, something like that. That means the beginning of uh, uh, the uh, critique of tradition. The beginning was, uh, after all, uh, 
religion, which was so important, which was practically uh, inside the global organization of societies, is not a necessity. Or, today, we have a sort of uh, global apparition of a new form of the contradiction between modernity and tradition. We have, in many parts of the world, <coughs> a violent return to tradition. We have apparition of political forces and uh, some states too, which affirm that the new way is the ancient way. <coughs> that the new way is the, the subjective and objective return to the laws of tradition. And we have that not only in uh, some part of the Western world and some other countries, like uh, some Arabic states and so on, but we have also that inside the Western world itself. We have a reactionary, uh, strictly speaking, <coughs> reactionary vision, which affirms that uh, some parts of the modern vision of the world are inaccessible that we must return to the strength of the tradition. And in some sense, and this is uh, uh, something uh, very striking, uh, we have today uh, some wars uh, between the representation of modernity and the representation of tradition. In the Middle East, but not only in the Middle East, we have a tradition, strong contradiction, which are not at all the contradiction with capitalism and communism, because there is no communism at all. <coughs> but we have contradiction between uh, modernity and tradition, that is, between some forms of freedom, of liberty, and some forms which are on the side of strict laws, strict separations, and so on. On the side of tradition, it's very important to see that uh, the question is the question of identity. Repetition, conservation of identity. Identities in the form of religious identity, but also family, nation, group, culture, moral principles, and so on. All that composing the tradition against uh, the modernity. And uh, a, a traditional politics, the projection of all that in politics, is always a politics of identities. To defend, to protect, to develop my identity at a national level, at a level of religious, of language, of group, of culture, of moral principle, and so on. And so today, we have a sort of apparition of uh, a global existence, of uh, uh, the tradition as a support for political action. Not only as a support for social existence, social, uh, but as a support for global uh, political orientation. And uh, sometimes, as you know, with some forms of uh, extreme violence. So some forms of uh, radicalism, in some sense, not in the direction of the uh, revolutionary establishment of communism, but in the sense of the conservation of identities, differences, <coughs> racialism, and so on. In some, some sense, the tradition is the idea that we must return to uh, repetition as a, a form of uh, society. There is, in tradition, uh, a sort of distrust of all what is new. We have, uh, in tradition, the idea that, uh, that we can transmit is of traditional nature. And uh, that we have the idea that new generations must be similar to ancient generations. And this is why uh, there is the idea of uh, the repetition as a true law of society and not innovation, creation, 
and, and so on. It's also why we have, in general, associated with uh, the tradition, the idea of uh, strong power. The state power must be the protector of tradition, and with uh, violence, repression, and so on. And it's also all that has also its beginning in the 80s. <coughs> uh, it's uh, in relationship with the end of communist state the apparition of uh, reactive politics. Uh, because uh, the, first, uh, the first great form for that um, has been the revolution in Iran, the Iranian revolution. It has been the first signal of the return to the revolution of identities, of uh, conservative uh, revolution. So it is why we are really the new world where the contradiction between tradition and modernity is really active, much more active in some sense, than the contradiction, structural contradiction, between capitalism <laughs> and communism. The fundamental point of the contemporary world is that the two contradictions are not at all identical. That is a new form. It's a great difference with the last century. Because in the last century, communism was in some sense something new, which affirmed its nobility. And which affirmed that it was in the descendancy of the Enlightenment of the 18th century. A new consequence of French Revolution a new development of the revolutionary training of French Revolution. And so the contradiction between capitalism and communism has the appearance of uh, a contradiction between modernity and tradition. Capitalism was the old world in some sense, and communism was the idea of a new world. And so we have not in the last century absolutely not the same picture we have not the differences between the contradiction, the strict contradiction between modernity and tradition, and the contradiction between capitalism and communism. We have, in some sense, the fusion of the two in the general uh, contradiction with two terms, capitalism and communism, and finally tradition on the side of capitalism and modernity on the side of communism as an appearance. As an appearance. So we can take the measure of the big change, which is a recent change. It's a change uh, which is uh, at the scale of uh, 50 years or, or <coughs> of, of no more. So I insist on this point. We are, all of us, <coughs> the witness of a very big change of the subjective situation of the world. We are not at all in a static world. We are confronted with something which is absolutely new in some sense and regard to the sequence which is between French Revolution and the end of communist state. Alors, now I come to the relationship between the uh, different terms. The situation today is finally that the relationship between capitalism and modernity is the dominant relationship. Of course, the dominant idea of today is that it is on the side of capitalism that we can find real modernity. Modernity in different forms, naturally, Economical development, technological superiority, but also new forms of relationship uh, between uh, men and women, uh, new liberalism uh, concerning the sexual existence, uh, and so on. All uh, the terms which characterize today uh, the, <coughs> the modernity freedom of thinking, uh, freedom of opinions, uh, but also. Uh, the whole uh, freedom of life itself, of, the, of personal life. We can do what we want, uh, in some sense. Uh, 
there is no uh, strict identity, there is no laws of tradition, and so on. And so, the world today is dominated, in my opinion, by a sort of fusion. Uh, it's an image, it's an ideology, it's not by necessity, absolutely true. It's a sort of fusion in a common opinion, uh, practically everywhere in the world, huh? that uh, the, uh, the superiority of capitalism not lies in capitalism itself, which is with big injustices, uh, big inequalities, and so on, uh, everybody knows that, but lies in the fact that it's only on the side of capitalism that we can find real modernity. And it is why there is everywhere in the world a desire of the West <coughs> that we can observe in Asia, for example, where, especially in the middle class. In the middle class in every country is we have something like a desire of the West. And I name desire of the West, in fact, the desire of modernity. But modernity at the price that modernity is in close relationship to capitalism. And so, uh, I, at the ideological level, the global situation is the existence, is uh, practically every part of the world, of something like a, a, a desire of the West, a desire to, to, to participate to the Western world in general, which is a desire of uh, modernity, and in including modernity of the possibility to, to, to find a, a work uh, in industry and so on. And so uh, it's a global desire, in some sense, which is uh, uh, the representation of uh, the relationship between modernity and capitalism. And I think that relationship exists today for two reasons for two reasons. First, we have had the experience of what is the relationship between capitalism and tradition. And this, I, I, I name this relationship fascism. Fascism can be defined as a form of capitalism inside tradition. It has been absolutely the case uh, uh, in the last century. Nazism, was absolutely a close relationship between capitalism, global capitalism, violent capitalism, and tradition in the form of nationalism, reactionary vision of family, uh, 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 affirmation that the woman must uh, stay in uh, the house, and so on. So the world of, uh, uh, the world of Hitler was absolutely the world of identities and tradition. The, and antisemitism, uh, criminal antisemitism, was a part of uh, this uh, tradition because antisemitism was a traditional uh, part of uh, ideology and identity in Germany in the 19th century. So we can name fascism the relationship between capitalism and tradition. <coughs> and so uh, 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 we must observe, I say, that after all, it's possible for capitalism to be linked to tradition. <laughs> Certainly, the Western world is defined by the relationship between capitalism and modernity, but it's not a necessity. In many countries, capitalism is developed in a context of a strong tradition, nationalism, <coughs> strong uh, Position between poor and rich, uh, division of labor, and so on, and despotist form of the state. It, uh, and even today, the forces we are violent in the side of tradition, that uh, some Arabic states uh, and uh, uh, some uh, uh, despotism uh, in Asia too, are absolutely on the side of capitalism. So it is why the Communism disappeared in some sense because uh, we have as the uh, most important phenomenon today that capitalism is in relation to modernity as a dominant level, 
but can be also in relationship to tradition when it's a necessity. We must recall that in many countries, capitalism has been developed under despotism. Take uh, the South Korea. South Korea, which is success, capitalist success, has been developed under uh, military dictatorship during decennies. So it's not true that capitalism is developed inside uh, democratic freedom and so on. It's its dominant form today in some countries, but this is not uh, its relationship by definition. So if we can name fascism, all strong relationship between capitalism and tradition, we have the first reason to prefer the West. <coughs> so capitalism in relationship to democracy and to modernity is objectively better than capitalism in relationship to despotism and tradition. We can say something like that. It's my first the second uh, point at the origin of the disparition, the progressive disparition of the uh, term communism, is that in socialist states, we have had a strong relationship between communism and tradition too. If we uh, observe uh, the form, the social form in the uh, Soviet Union, uh, we find uh, uh, very conservative concerning, concerning family, concerning uh, sexual relationship, concerning work of art, academic vision, hostility of new form of capitalism, rejection of psychoanalysis, and even rejection of the relativity of Einstein, and so on. And uh, military nationalism, too. So, in fact, the failure of socialist states has been their relationship to tradition. The idea that to have a new state, the possibility of a new state, we cannot go against the traditional identities, but in some sense use the traditional identities in relationship to the development of uh, the new power. And so, uh, I name socialist states the relationship not between capitalism and tradition, but between uh, communism and tradition. And it is why there is something like a symmetry, not an identity, not at all. There is a symmetry uh, between the adventure of socialist state and the adventure of fascism, which is precisely that they maintain the tradition as a fundamental reference to the global organization of a society. So, the great question today is the possible relationship between communism and modernity. That is the conclusion. That is lacking in the picture. <coughs> it is why the, the new uh, communist uh, politics uh, is not a line, full, full line. It's something which is precarious and maybe uh, in existence. Uh, as a, uh, an historical confirmation of uh, this schema, we, we can see that, uh, for example, uh, the Second World War has been uh, alliance between Western world and socialist state against fascism. And it was possible because precisely of the fact that communism, socialist state, was not reducible to capitalism. And so fascism was opposed to socialist states, not in the name of tradition, because in some sense they are also very conservative states. <coughs> and but on the name of uh, the opposition to communism. So it has been a, a, a paradoxical war, in some sense, with the alliance between Western world on the side of capitalism and modernity, and socialist states 
on the side of communism and tradition against fascism, because fascism, in some sense, was the enemy of the two. And so uh, the, the, the Second World War uh, is uh, uh, that sort of uh, alliance. Immediately after, when uh, fascism is reduced, is vanquished, we have the restitution of another contradiction, completely different, which is a strong contradiction between Western world and socialist states, the Cold War. Cold War, this is and even this time, the real motive of the war is the contradiction between capitalism and communism, not the contradiction between uh, tradition and modernity. And so during the Cold War, in some sense, the question of tradition is not a question. We have only, uh, uh, it, it, it's a disappearing of uh, this uh, uh, sign. And actually, it is a form of the disparition of uh, the Nazi state and the Mussolini state and so on. And so we can explain really the history of the recent history from different uh, structures inside uh, the, the fundamental uh, uh, square that uh, you have here. And Today, it's not alliance between Western world and socialist state against fascism, because socialist state is uh, something which has disappeared. It's not a, a direct contradiction between Western world and fascism, even if we are the beginning of something like that with the situation in the Middle East and in some other regions where the new fascism, which is a religious one in some sense, the new fascism, which is a religious one, is a real difficulty uh, for the Western world for uh, many reasons. I think it's my conviction that the birth of uh, that form of new religious fascism, that is this new relationship between Capitalism in the tradition is the failure of communism. In uh, the real movement of history, uh, normally uh, you must have something else. And that what is something that we must have new relationship between communism and modernity. That is the point. And uh, it's uh, our distress today that something like that does not really exist. That exists as a possibility, as a desire, as a will. That exists in many small uh, <coughs> experimentations, but as a global level, it does not exist. And the failure has been the relationship between communism and tradition. And so, to, 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 to conclude uh, with that, uh, what is our task? <coughs> what is our task? I think that the lessons of history is that the success of capitalism has been the success of the Western world, not the success of fascism. Fascism has been crashed. Even if you have new forms of capitalism, there are no future, there is no real future. And capitalism has been crashed by the alliance between Western world and socialist states. Because without Russia, the question would be very difficult. <coughs> but, uh, the final success of the Western world today is uh, domination, which is ideological domination, is something like the capture of modernity by capitalism. And uh, every form of contradiction with the Western world appears today largely on the side of tradition. 
And this is why today we have big developments of uh, a sort of extreme uh, right wing <coughs> on the side of the uh, alliance between capitalism and tradition. And uh, certainly, uh, uh, any movement on the side of modernity, new modernity, but our task is really to completely uh, formalize and active and create as a divine hypothesis the relationship between communism and modernity. And, and this, this task, you know, is very difficult because I think that is not simply that communism must be on the side of modernity as modernity exists. Because this modernity is on the side of capitalism. And uh, certainly there is no other modernity today that is opposed. That that form of modernity, which is the modernity of uh, production, the modernity of uh, freedom, the modernity of uh, free enterprise, uh, the modernity of uh, financial globalization, and so on, technological modernity, all that you want. But at the end, all these forms of modernity are inside the structure of globalized capitalism. And so the difficulty, and this is here that the question for the philosopher, is what is to invent modernity? What is to create a new modernity? A new enlightenment? Because the enlightenment, the classical enlightenment, Rousseau, Voltaire, French Revolution, and uh, after that, all fields of creation are probably today in a too close relationship to capitalism to be useful for a new communism. And so we must invent a new modernity. And I think it is why question of uh, ecological nature, question of uh, feminine nature, question also of new forms of art. And uh, as is said by Deleuze, new form of life, new form of uh, education, new forms of uh, what is to observe the development of uh, children. New forms of uh, relationship between uh, new form of organization of the world. All that is so important. It's so important because it's not a only eventually new political revendications <coughs> or uh, new, uh, uh, new form of freedom that uh, capitalism uh, uh, can organize. <coughs> After all, capitalism is indifferent uh, to the difference between men and women and so on. For capitalism, you are a consumer, all is good. <coughs> if you want to buy something, okay, we will put that, you see. So it's uh, really at the level of the relationship between human beings that is the question is uh, real. And it's a sign that we must invent a new, a new model. <coughs> And so it's only at the price of invention of a new modernity that the first part of the square, which is the part of the future, really, uh, which is the possibility to go outside uh, the relationship between modernity, capitalism, and tradition, uh, uh, will we, we create a new situation. A new situation. And so, Finally, it is why politics today is much more than politics. We cannot reduce politics to politics because the invention of a new modernity uh, is something much more bigger than uh, political action. It mobilizes all forms of truth 
Io questo lo, lo, lo questiono in ufficioso, per la sensibilità di questo è il nostro work of art, la questione di new forms, la questione di science, la questione di new relationship between science and technology, the freedom of science, which is not real today, because science today is a part of the capitalism itself, so a new freedom of science, and naturally new forms of politics also. All that is uh, under the idea to create a new modern. And we have also uh, to do the work concerning ourselves, because we are in the idea that uh, we are in, in modernity. But maybe we are in a sort of false modernity, or maybe a used modernity. Modernity which has been created finally in the 18th century, and which is now completely the slave of the capitalism at the globalized system. So we must invent a new modernity. It's a global task. It's not a specialized task. It concerns all forms of truth. And uh, it's my, uh, my conclusion <laughs> that uh, we will, all of us, in the front of creation of a new modernity. Thank you. simplest form. In fact, uh, you must have uh, uh, some relationship between, for example, Western world and new communist politics, like a new line, and this line is a line of conflict. And uh, I think, I speak of contradiction at an abstract level, but as a real, it's a conflict. I agree with you. And so we have conflict here, and for example, uh, uh, if you If you speak of uh, the, uh, the Second World War, we have also conflict between Western world, socialist state, and fascism. It's not a structural contradiction, it's really an historical conflict. And so, uh, I, I agree with you. But uh, today, in some sense, it was uh, cautious to not speak of a conflict because maybe we are, uh, for the moment, too weak. Of conflict. It's, <coughs> the, the question, incidentally, is not really meant as a criticism, okay. but as a, uh, as a way to think also about uh, the formulation of new, uh, of new strategies that are not, uh, are not organizable by contemporary capitalism. Yeah, yeah, but I, if, if, we, if we move much more in, uh, in the, the, the real process, Uh, uh, we must uh, uh, give a more complex form of uh, all the diagram, and we must introduce, in fact, the distinction between real conflict and the structural contradiction. But uh, the contradiction here, uh, the picture is the picture of the world, or finally all is in the world. <laughs> contradiction too. <laughs> Do uh, pre-modern communist movements offer some possibilities for the future? Is there, is there something of modern significance in the pre-modern when it comes to socialistic, communistic movements? Such as the you know, English Civil War or 
uh, other possibilities, messianic movements, things of that sort. I think I think uh, I affirm myself that it's a possibility, naturally. <coughs> and uh, we begin always by uh, by conviction concerning that sort of thing. You know, when Marx uh, writes the uh, manifesto of uh, communist parties, there is a neither communist party uh, nor real at, at a big scale communist ideas. There is nothing at all in some sense. Only some tendency, local. My position today is that if we don't accept and affirm uh, the possibility of uh, something new in the relationship between communist ideas or every form of opposition to capitalism, not only communism, but every new form of opposition to capitalism, and modernity, uh, you have by necessity in the repetition of the global structure. That is my conviction. And naturally, many people think that, okay, so you cannot invent, you cannot even try some uh, new forms of communism uh, after the failure of uh, the inventions of the last century. But I think that it's not because uh, you have had a failure that uh, we must renounce to the idea. It is my, my, my conviction. Because I cannot think that capitalism and modernity as created inside uh, capitalism are the end of history. If it's the, if it, if, if it the end of history, history is uh, really not I have two questions. One is a point of explanation regarding the diagram, and the other one is a point of detail. Uh, if I understand well, uh, you said that the first horizontal contradiction is an idealized one because communism is a possibility. And I would like to understand your way of conceptualizing communism. You said that it is not pertaining to the reality of the communist states of the 20th century, but you go back to Marx thinking. Yet, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Marx seemed to suggest that communism is not merely a possibility, it is a historical necessity. Second, uh, and again, I may be wrong if this correct me, uh, he seemed to suggest that communism does not enter uh, into contradiction, but is the dialectical resolution of contradiction. So uh, it is just a point of explanation. I would like to better understand your way of conceptualizing communism. And my second question is a very small question of detail. Where in this diagram would you put contemporary China? Who love capitalism and uh, respect for national tradition on the part of fascism or on the part of socialist state? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, verification to my understanding. Could you dire en français? Donc, juste euh, un point d'explication sur votre. Euh, à, à propos de votre. de la contradiction occidentale. Oui. J'aurais bien voulu comprendre votre façon de conce conceptualiser le terme communisme. Mm -hmm. Puisque vous avez dit que c'est une contradiction qui est idéalisée, euh, car euh, le communisme n'est qu'une possibilité. Et euh, il m'a semblé que vous avez. Euh, vous avez. Euh, 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 vous êtes retourné à. vous avez voulu retourner à la pensée de Marx. Or, et je voudrais que vous me corrigiez si je gère, 
En cela, il va sembler que Marx a dit que le communisme n'est pas une possibilité, c'est une nécessité historique. Deuxième point, que le communisme n'entre pas comme terme en relation dans des contradictions, mais qu'il est la résolution des euh, dialectiques des contradictions. Donc j'aurais bien tout simplement voulu comprendre votre façon de comprendre ce terme ici sur le chemin. Ça c'est la première question. Okay. La deuxième question euh, est une question de détail. J'aurais bien voulu savoir où est-ce que vous seriez tenté de placer la Chine contemporaine avec son développement du capitalisme et son, son attachement pour la tradition. Du côté de, du fascisme ou du côté de l'État social Uh, concerning the first uh, question, I agree with you that uh, in some form of uh, uh, Hegelianism, uh, Marx uh, inscribed uh, uh, the communist hypothesis in the field of historical necessity. It's true. Uh, it's possible that uh, maybe it has been for Marx himself Uh, more and more uh, difficult to assume uh, a clear uh, necessity of this, but uh, we cannot discuss of, uh, <coughs> the details of uh, the evolution of Marx. But uh, uh, for me, uh, communism today is, uh, uh, is not inscribed in uh, historical necessity. I assume that it's not. And so we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot be uh, quite in uh, our side, uh, thinking that history works for us. <laughs> uh, history uh, does not work for us today. I don't think we have seen in sense. And so we can assume that uh, communism must be a project. And this is why my position is that we are in the third stage of the development historical development of the idea of communism. We have the first stage, which is the invention by Marx of uh, the communist vision as, uh, in fact, a uh, sort uh, of historical necessity, that is, resolution of the contradiction of capitalism itself. Capitalism, uh, think, uh, as a contradictory project. There have been the second stage of communism initiated by Lenin, in fact, which has been the realization of uh, uh, socialism in a, the form of a new state and uh, uh, the reduction of uh, some part of communism because communism was the idea of uh, vanishing of the state and it has been, in fact, uh, very strong uh, state for all. And we know the failure of this second step. And I think we enter into the third stage of the idea of communism, when we know that uh, communism is not uh, the deterministic result of contradiction of capitalism, and uh, that uh, communism cannot be the realization uh, of uh, a new despotic state in relation to some form of equality. And so, uh, we must, uh, returning to the principle of communism, as uh, the principle of a new possible politics. So, affirmation of some principle and verification by uh, political activity of the value of these principles. And if, at a moment, History works for us, it will be a good thing. <coughs> But uh, we, 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 we cannot uh, ask the sort of And uh, 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 concerning the, uh, concerning the uh, China, I think China is typically uh, something uh, as a mixture of fascism and Western world. It's a new figure, um, because it's a, the failure of a socialist state, the a form of a, a new development in a capitalistic form, and a, a, 
uh, a state with by many many <coughs> elements are a despotic state. Despotic state, which is the result, the paradoxical result, the the thing which is maintained uh, from uh, the socialist sequence. So it's a it's a novelty, yeah? it's a novelty, but progressively it's not so much a novelty because it's uh, the despotic form of uh, primitive accumulation uh, in uh, capitalism itself. And we know that, uh, the example of uh, South Korea, but the development of uh, capitalism and uh, in France uh, uh, during uh, Napoleon III's term was uh, also a despotic state which was uh, proposed a new framework for the development of uh, capitalism. So the, the strange fact concerning uh, China is that this specific state is uh, uh, the result of uh, a very specific history, which has been under the name of socialism and communism. But uh, in my diagram, uh, China is uh, between Western world and, uh, and uh, somewhere between the Western world and fascism. Western world on the side of progressive modernity and the development of capitalism on the side of fascism by the despotism of the state power. But my, my vision is that the despotism of the state power in China, if uh, nothing changes, uh, uh, will finish one day. Because there is always a moment where uh, the <coughs> despotic form of the state is not an obligation for capitalist development. <coughs> and so finally, a democratic transition in China uh, was uh, <coughs> uh, not for me uh, a surprise. <coughs> Maybe uh, it will be too old to see that. <coughs> it's a possibility. Okay? <laughs> ah, two questions. Three questions. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate that you uh, clarify that for us, communism is not a historical necessity. Uh, but my question is the way that you define the possibility of communism uh, in negative relation to capitalism as we know it. And, and my question is this, uh, does that not in its way replicate the danger that you point out in the ethics of trying to define the good by starting with the evil, and instead of affirming the good first as a primary term and working to, to then define the evil. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, you, um, you define uh, your project for communism by beginning with the negative. Uh, and that differs from the ethics, where you uh, argue that you should start with the good rather than the evil. So are you starting with the evil by starting with the negative? Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that good? Merci. It's a, the, the, the discovery of my internal contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in, uh, uh, I, I agree with your question because in some sense I am give the idea that my beginning was a ne negative one. But it is not, uh, it's not uh, completely true uh, because it's a presentation in a form, a structural form of uh, contradiction. In fact, in, in fact my, my, my beginning uh, is the idea of communism. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a, the sequence of possibilities that I have here. It's my beginning. After that, we know that all these possibilities are precisely what the capitalism uh, declares impossible. But it's my logic. It's my logic uh, in that uh, metaphysical level. The real of something is always 
the point of impossibility of this something. So the realm of capitalism, in some sense, is equality. That is precisely the realm that is what the capitalism cannot resolve in itself. So what is stay outside its possibility. And it's uh, the famous definition of the real by Lacan, which is that the real is the impasse of formalization. The, uh, the formalization, the capitalist formalization of society has precisely a point of impossibility, which is its proper real, uh, and what is equality. So it's affirmative in some sense. And it begins at the point where capitalism finishes. <coughs> and, and, and communism has been, for the very beginning, to say that what is probably the impossibility for capitalism, that is the disparition of private property, which is absolutely the, the impossible point for capitalism, precisely the beginning of the new, the new vision. But, Abolition of uh, private property is negative, so only in appearance. In fact, it's not. It's not. And we can say that uh, the fundamental idea of Marx is that we can organize the production and not a form of uh, free association and not a form of uh, private appropriation. And so, uh, formally, your remark was good, appearance of negativity, but uh, in the content, it's not negativity which, which comes first. Naturally, the, the inclination to begin by negativity is that I don't find the contemporary situation very good. <laughs> and, 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 but uh, but I, I, I begin, at the end, I begin by the, the, new, the new notion of what is good, precisely. So, uh, 
Naturally, autonomia is a part of the, our beginning. Uh, it's a part of our beginning in the, question, the specific question of uh, the transition between social uh, revolts, social problems, and uh, uh, politics as such. And so, uh, uh, I, uh, my, my uh, many friends uh, will discuss because I am coming from autonomia. Specifically, my Italian friends and so on. But uh, in some sense, uh, I am not completely convinced that uh, we can do without any form of organization uh, much more. Uh, how can I can say that? Not by repetition of the Leninist Party, okay? Because the Leninist Party was, in fact, a military organization. The goal was to win the insurrection. The goal was to be victorious. After all the terrible uh, failures of all insurrections during the 19th century, finally the Commune de Paris, as a, as a principal example, Lenin thought that uh, to be victorious, if revolution is in the form of insurrection, to be victorious, we must have as disciplined troops as police and army. <coughs> and if we are disorganized, we cannot. And so uh, we cannot object to Lenin on this point. It was true. It was true, in fact. Uh, in Russia, Lenin was the first victorious insurrection. And this is the reason why it has been so important during many years. And so, <coughs> but the Leninist Party was the result of the conviction, the primary conviction, that the success of the revolution is always to be victorious at the level of a state power, to take the state power to destroy the old power and to establish the new power. And it was the vision of the 19th century, it was not the vision of Lenin as such. It was the vision of all insurrection of workers in France and in Germany and so on during all the 19th century. So Lenin had solved the problem which was the problem of 19th century. I think that we, we are not at the same beginning not, our problem is not, in some sense, to take the state power immediately. Uh, our problem is to reorganize the subjectivity of the revolution. To reorganize the communist idea in its concrete form, in its collective form. And so, autonomia is an hypothesis uh, at the level of our problem today. But, uh, uh, is is autonomia uh, uh, sufficient? Uh, I am not completely convinced. I think that we, we cannot return to the military form, centralized and so on, the party in its uh, Leninist form. But uh, uh, we, we cannot uh, think that uh, the social movement as such uh, creates by itself uh, the political forms which are necessary to create new modernity at the political But it's a very, uh, it's in fraternal. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks very much. Uh,